Hey guys, so I'm going to go ahead and do a video here. I'm going to go through all of the even problems. You already have the answers to the odds. Of course, as you guys know, you still need to show work to get credit for the problems, but you can check your work with the odd problems at least. And um, I will work out the even problems here in case you had some questions about how to do these. Um, every even problem will match the odd one that comes just before it, so you can use the strategy I show you to help you out with the odd one and then check your answer with the answer key when you're done. Um, let's go ahead and get started here. So this is a review test coming up here on Wednesday. And so we're just picking random but important topics from each unit um, just to kind of keep you sharp on the old skills. And so this is solving a basic linear equation. Okay. And so basically you just need to remember the steps for solving a basic linear equation. The first step is going to be, if possible, distribute. So as you guys can see, I do have some distribution I can do here. So if we distribute, we end up with negative 32a plus 24 on the right side there. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and combine like terms on the left and on the right side. So as I look on the left side of the equal sign, there's no like terms to combine. But as I look on the right side, I do have some terms I can combine. The 7a and the 32a both have an a, and so I can combine those together. 7 take away 32. Let's see, what would that be? I believe that would be negative 25a. Okay, so these two terms come together to make that. Okay, now the next thing that we do after we combine our like terms is if you have an A on both sides of, equa of the equation, you're going to either add or subtract um, the smallest variable term. So in this case, what's smaller, negative 5 or negative 25? Well, negative 25 is smaller because it's more negative, right? So I want to get rid of that negative 25, so I'm going to add it. Now, technically, it really doesn't matter which one you move. You'll still get the right answer. But I just prefer to move the smaller one because by doing that, you can avoid having negatives, which I know a lot of you guys don't prefer. So by adding 25 on both sides, we end up with this. Okay. Uh, the last thing you're going to do is you're just going to solve. Okay. So at this point, you have what you might remember from Algebra 1 as being called a two-step equation. So basically, you just have to get A by itself. So you're going to add 36 first to both sides. And then you're going to divide both sides by 20. And then when you're all done doing that, you should have your final answer of A equals 3. So that's the answer to number 2. And you're going to follow a similar process for solving equations there. So when you have a linear equation, how do you solve it? You just basically distribute, combine, move the smaller variable, and solve. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the next question you'll be asked to do. You're going to be given a system of equations that looks something like this, and you're going to be asked to find the x coordinate of that system of equations. Now, typically, when you solve a system, you only need to find, well, actually, you need to find the x and the y, but for these questions, I'm just going to ask you to find the x. Okay. Now, there's quite a, a process that we have to go through to do that. There's, first of all, there's two ways to solve a system of equations. One way is the substitution method. The other way is the elimination method. How do you know when to use one method or the other? Well, when you have the x's and y's lining up like this and the numbers on the other side, anytime that's there like that, that's pretty set up for what we call the elimination method. So the first thing that we do if we want to solve a system of equations using the elimination method is you got to pick a variable that you want to cancel. Okay, so let's say I choose to cancel out, um, you know what, well, yeah, we'll, we'll pick the x's, why not? Pick a variable to cancel. Okay, so I'm going to pick the x's. All right. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do something called flip and distribute. 
And what do I mean by that? You're going to take the coefficients on each of those x's and you're going to flip them over. You're going to put the 2 on the top and the 5 on the bottom. So there's our flip. And then we're going to distribute that in to the equation. So basically we multiply the top equation by the x coefficient of the bottom. And we multiply the bottom equation by the x coefficient of the top. Or, just to put it easily, flip and distribute. Now after you do that, something interesting should happen. And the interesting thing that should happen is that now those x's should have the same exact value. They should be exactly the same. And that's pretty close to what we want to have happen. But we want one more thing to happen before we can get into the actual elimination step. The next thing we want is we don't want them to be the same number exactly. We actually want them to be opposites. So I'm going to multiply one equation by a negative. And it doesn't matter which one you do. So I'm going to go ahead and do the top here. I'm just going to multiply the top by a negative one. So all the way through. So the top equation now becomes negative 10x plus 18y equals 44. And the bottom equation is going to stay the same because I didn't do anything to that one. Okay. Now we're ready for the next step, and this is why we call it the elimination method. Because now that I've got these two x terms here to have the same number but opposite signs, I'm going to combine the equations together and when I do, the x's are going to cancel. So for instance, negative 10 plus 10 is 0, so they cancel. But you have to do it for everything else also. So 18 take away 10 is 8, so I end up with 8y here. And 44 combined with a negative 60, uh, I believe that's going to be negative 16. And then the last thing I need to do is just divide both sides by 8. So we need to solve at this point for y. So I'm going to divide both sides by 8, and I end up with y equals negative 2. Now in this case, I didn't get the answer I wanted. I wanted to find x, right? But I found the y. Well, that's okay. To find the last variable, all you do is you plug your answer into one of the original equations, and you can solve for the other variable. So, for instance, suppose I chose this equation right here, 5x minus 9y equals negative 22. I'm going to plug in negative 2 for the y. And then I can solve for x. And from there, we're just going to do some basic two-step equation math here, so minus the 18 on both sides. And I think we end up with negative 40 over here when we put the negative 22 and negative 18 together. And finally, division on both sides will give me 80, x equals negative 8. And so my answer is D in this case. Okay. Now, sometimes you won't have to do this last step. Because, like I said, I only want you to find one variable. So if you get lucky and you solve for the right variable to begin with, then you don't have to do this last step of finding the other one. And since we're solving for x, it would be nice if you guys just found the x to begin with instead of the y. How can you do that so that you don't have to do this last step? Well, if you want to try to take a shortcut, the issue happened at the very beginning when I picked a variable. I wanted to cancel out the x's. So if you cancel out the x's, the x is gone, which means you're going to solve for y. So if you want to uh, solve for x first, then instead start by with the coefficients on the y's. That'll make it a little bit easier, a little bit less work. But it doesn't matter. Either way, you'll get the right answer if you just kind of work it all the way through. So what are the steps? Pick a variable, flip and distribute, change the signs in one of the equations, and combine those equations together and solve. And if necessary, find the other variable by plugging your answer in to one of the original equations. All right, so that's another question that you'll be asked on our review test for Wednesday. Let's go ahead and take a look at number six. Number six, the directions are just to evaluate, you guys. And all that means is, is you're going to plug this number in for x into this equation. So I'm going to take my g of x equation, and I'm going to replace the x's in that equation with a zero. 
And 0 plus 5, as you guys know, is just 5. So that's pretty straightforward there. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look also at number 8. Number 8, we're being asked to find the inverse. Now, finding an inverse can be a little tricky, a little bit more steps involved. Let's go ahead and take a look at that one. First of all, let's, let's review what is an inverse. You don't need to know this necessarily to get the answer, but it kind of helps everything to make sense. An inverse is a function where, suppose I took 1 and I plug in, well actually I'll just pick a number that actually works here. Suppose I picked 3 to plug into the g function. Well, if I were to plug in 3, I would get negative 8 as an answer. Now, I'm not going to show my work for that. You could just take my word for it. But if you were to plug in 3, you get negative 8. Well, we're looking for an inverse function. And here's how you write an inverse function. An inverse function looks like this. Now, an inverse function does the same exact thing as the other function. It's just that everything's flipped. So instead of plugging in a 3 and getting out an 8, we would plug in a negative 8 and get out a 3. So I'm looking for a new equation that will do this. But more importantly, I'm looking for an equation that will do that for any number I pick. Okay, And so that's what we want to do is we want to find a new equation that will give me this flipped outcome no matter what numbers I pick. Okay, And we call that an inverse function. Inverse functions are kind of nice if you ever need to find a formula for quickly finding inputs for any given output a bunch of times. Um, but I digress. Let's begin. So step one is to replace the g of x with a y. Okay, so I'm going to replace that with a y. And the only reason that we do that is just because the g of x is a big clunky symbol and it's kind of irritating to work with. So we just kind of replace it with something a little bit simpler. And what the heck, it represents y anyway, so let's just keep things simple and put y. All right, now the next thing we're going to do, this is the real inverse step, is we're going to switch the x and the y around. So in other words, I'm going to put my x where the y is, and I'm going to put my y where the x was. The next step is the trickier step, because every problem is going to be a little bit different. But just to put it basically, what we want to do is we want to solve for y. We want to get y by itself. Because whenever you have a function, you, you always have the y by itself. So now that I've flipped those, I want to get y by itself. How will we do that? Well, first of all, I don't like fractions, right? So in this case, I'm going to get rid of that fraction there by multiplying this term here by a 3. Because if you multiply a fraction by its denominator, these two things cancel each other out. And so I'm left with this. But I'm only allowed to do that in an equation so long as I do that to every other term. And so here I would end up with negative 12 equals and then 3x. So you have to multiply everything by the denominator. All right. Now if I wanted to keep um, solving this um, for y, the next thing I would recommend doing is, is adding or subtracting, depending on what's relevant. Um, so in this case, we end up with 3x plus 12 equals negative 4y. And then we have one more step. We're going to divide both sides by a negative 4. So if I divide both sides by a negative 4, this is what that would look like. Okay. Now technically, now that we've rewritten the equation to look a little bit different, instead of putting y here, I'm going to put the g back. But this time, this is a new function. This is the inverse function. And so we're going to write that instead. And so you could write your answer like this, but you could also simplify it a little bit. So I don't know how it's going to look on your test. It may be like this. But another way that this answer could be written, I will show you, because it's hard to say. The software sometimes does it one way and sometimes it does another. So I want to make sure that you guys know how to do both. Um, is You could split this single fraction up into two. You could do 3x over negative 4 plus 12 over negative 4 instead. So in other words, you're taking those two terms in the numerator and splitting it up into two separate fractions with the same denominator there. And if you were to rewrite this a little bit cleaner, 
that 3x over negative 4 would really just be the same thing as negative 3 fourths x. And then here, if you're adding 12 divided by negative 4, well, that's like adding a negative 3, so it's just minus 3. So this is possibly another way to write the answer. Okay, um, But nonetheless, the steps are replace the g with a y. After that, switch the x and y. After that, solve for y. Um, and sometimes you got to simplify it a little bit. Now, I, I want to warn you guys of something. Um, let me back up a little bit here. So you remember how I solved this one here? I had g of x equals negative 4 minus 4 over 3x, right? And, well, let's go ahead and put the y in there, right? Then we switched it. How did I, what was the first thing I did to get the y by itself? Well, I multiplied everything by 3, right? And I got this. Okay, fair enough. But now, let me give you guys a little bit of a different situation. Let's say that you guys had something that looked like this. Because this is actually a different expression. They look a little bit similar, but these are actually different expressions. So if you guys had something like this to begin with, and you needed to get that, well, actually, if we have to switch the x and y, right? So let's do that first. But if you had this and you wanted to get the y by itself, well, really, we only have one fraction here now, right? This way, it's written like we have two separate terms, so I have to multiply both of them by 3. But if it's written like this, then we have one fraction. So if you want to get rid of the 3, you don't need to multiply the four, you don't need to multiply that denominator of three there. You don't need to put it here and here. Okay, that's not necessary because we're really looking at just one big fraction. So all you have to do for this one is multiply the whole thing by three, and that cancels those completely. But you do have to multiply this side. So those are different, that's a different situation. So try not to get this format mixed up with this, because they are different. In this case, we have two terms, so we have to multiply both of them by the denominator. In this case, we have one fraction, so we just multiply that whole fraction itself by 1, 3. Okay, so be careful with that particular situation. All right, let's go ahead and move on to number 10. Number 10, we're looking at um, doing a composite function. This is what we call a composite function. A composite function is what you get when you plug one function into another function. Okay? Um, so, how does this work? Well, I gave you guys some steps for that a little while back. The steps are a little bit um, goofy, honestly, but it's, it's nice whenever you don't remember how to do it, but after you kind of get it, the steps kind of become unnecessary. But here's the steps that I gave, okay? The first thing I told you guys to do is to write the inside function first. So let's start by doing that. What do I mean by that? I mean there's a function on the outside, which is g, and then there's a function on the inside, which is h. So I want you guys to just write out the inside function first. So let's just write it out, just like this. Just rewrite it. Not a big deal. All right. The next thing I said to do was to write the outside function underneath of it. But replace the x's with parentheses. Okay, so I'm going to write this outside function here, the g function now. I'm going to write that underneath of it. But where the x's are, well, I guess in this case they're ends. But where the ends are, I'm going to replace the ends just with some blank parentheses, just like that. So instead of g of n equals n minus 3, I have g of parentheses equals parentheses minus 3. Now the reason why we're going to do that is because we're going to insert the top into the bottom. What do I mean by that? Well, let, let me show you. Here's the top function. I'm going to insert it into the parentheses. Same thing over here. Drop it in. So if I do that, I'm going to end up with g of h of n which is what the problem was asking for, right, is equal to 
n plus 5 minus 3. And simplify it as much as you can. So in this case, 5 take away 3 is 2, so the final answer would just be n plus 2, if you combine those two constants together. So write the inside function first, then write the outside function, replacing, replacing the variable with parentheses, and then insert the top function into the bottom function, and then, of course, simplify as much as you can after that. And that's how we do a composite function. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the next one. Now, this next one, once again, we have two functions, but we're not making a composite function this time. I'm not plugging a function into a function. I'm just doing something with the functions. And in this case, I'm dividing the functions. So I want to take the g of x function, and I want to divide it by the f of x function. Now, the g of x function equals this. So I'm just going to replace g of x with what it equals there. And the f of x function equals this. So I'm just going to replace f of x with what it equals. Now technically this answer is good enough, but that's not how they're going to write it. Um, and now for yours over here, you guys are doing subtraction. So for you, you're just going to simplify it like you normally would. You know, you combine the like terms and all that good stuff. But over here, you, the only way we can really write it is as a fraction. And that's what you do with division. So division is a little bit different. But there you go. But the point is, is write out your expression, replace it with what those functions are, and then simplify to get your final answer. All right, so that does it for functions. Let's go ahead and take a look at number 14 here. We're solving an equation again, but this time it's a absolute value function. Absolute value functions were something we did back in unit 3. So the first thing you want to do is you want to get rid of the outside numbers. What do I mean by that? I mean get rid of the numbers that are outside of the absolute value bars. So for instance, I have two numbers that are outside of the absolute value bars. I've got 10 and negative 9. And you just want to get rid of both of those. Now, which one do you get rid of first? You would get rid of the negative 9 because the way you get rid of that is by adding. And you always do adding or subtracting first. So let's do that. That's going to give me 10, 8b minus 6 equals 60. Then to get rid of the 10, I know a lot of you guys are going to be really tempted to distribute this. And I'm going to encourage you to not do that. Because when you put something inside of an absolute value expression, you're changing its sign to positive. Well, in this case, the 10 is positive, so maybe it wouldn't matter. But I would just say, as a general rule of thumb, I would not encourage you to ever distribute into an absolute value function because that has the potential to change the number. So instead, what I'm going to encourage you guys to do is just divide both sides by that 10, which is multiplying the absolute value. So that's going to be this. Now, once you have all the outside numbers eliminated, uh, we're going to split. And when you split it up, you're going to have one where it equals a positive and one where it equals a negative. Because when it comes to absolute value bars, there are two things that have an absolute value of 6. One of them is positive 6, and the other one is negative 6. So that means that 8b minus 6 can equal a negative 6, but it can also equal a positive 6. And then from there, we just simply just solve both of these expressions here. So I'm going to add 6 on both sides. And if I divide both sides by 8, I'm going to end up with 0. So one of my answers is 0. Let's take a look at this other one here. I'm going to add 6 on both sides, which gives me 12 this time. And I'm going to divide both sides by 8. So that means I'm going to get 12 over 8, which is going to reduce to be 3 halves, I believe, if you divide the top and bottom by 4. So we have two answers, 0 and 3 halves. Now, I just want to warn you guys of something else. Um, now, right now, this problem's okay the way it is. But let's just say you get rid of these two numbers, and after you get rid of those two numbers, you still have a negative number over here. Well, absolute values can never equal a negative. So if you ever get to the place where you just have an absolute value equal to a negative, you're actually going to stop and say no solution. 
if you forget to do that, you're still going to get an answer, but you're going to be wrong. So you have to catch that. So if you ever get to a place where you have absolute value is equal to a negative, you need to stop and say, oops, no solution. All right, so watch out for that. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and move on to number 16. Um, number 16 and 18, I'm asking you guys to graph quadratic equations, but the difference is, is that this one here is in vertex form, and this one here is in standard form. Graphing in vertex form is a little bit more chill, okay? When you want to graph in vertex form, um, just two things you got to keep in mind, and after you got those two things down, you pretty much will be able to get the graph. Vertex form looks like this. And here's what we know. We know that the vertex is going to be the opposite of this letter, which is H, and this letter, which is K. We don't do the opposite for the K, though. We keep the K the same, but for the H, we change the sign. And also, if you have a positive A value, it's a happy face. And if you have a negative A value, it's going to be a sad face. Okay. Now, the A can also determine whether it's wide or stretched or normal, but we really don't care about that. Um, this is a multiple choice test. So if you know these two things, you're going to have enough information to be able to get the answer. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one. So for this one, the vertex is going to be at the opposite of this number as well as with this number, but not an opposite for that. So negative 6, negative 1 is the vertex. And my A is a negative 1. So since I have an A that's a negative number, I know it's a sad face parabola. So if I wanted to graph this, it's as simple as going left 1 down 6 to find my vertex. And then I'm going to draw an upside down sad face, and I'm good to go. That's my graph. Okay. Just keep in mind that if you are ever missing some numbers, like let's just say you have an expression that doesn't have an H, then that means it's zero. Or if it doesn't have a K, that means it's zero. But beware, if you don't have an A, that actually means it's a one. And I kind of had that situation here. They didn't have a number there, but that just means it's a one. So if you're missing an H or a K, that means those values are zero. But if you're missing an A, that means it's one. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at the number 18. So once again, we're graphing a quadratic, but this time it's in standard form. And graphing a quadratic in standard form is a little bit more tedious than graphing a quadratic in vertex form. So um, now if you remember how to change it into vertex form, you could do that, and it will work so long as you do it right. But there is a way to graph it directly from standard form, and, and here it is. All right, so step one is to find the x value of the vertex. And the way that you do that is by using this little formula, negative b over 2a. So let's do that. Negative b over 2a. a is the number in front of the x squared. Negative 6 is the number in front of, I'm sorry, b is the number in front of the x. And then c is the number that doesn't have an x. So negative b. So b is negative 6 and a is 1. Now we have double negatives on the top, which makes 6, and 2 times 1 is 2 on the bottom, and therefore it's 3. So the x value of the vertex is 3. But now we need to find the y value of the vertex. And the way that you're going to do this is you're going to plug the x value you just found in step one into the equation, right? I mean, if you know x, just plug it in over here and you can find the y. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to say, okay, y equals x squared minus 6x plus 13. And I know that the x is 3 for the vertex. So if I just solve this, then I can find the y value. Got to remember your order of operations. It's especially important for the first one because sometimes there'll be a number up here in the front and a lot of students make the mistake of multiplying those two numbers first and then squaring. That's wrong. Order of operations is 
is you do the power first. So let's do that first. After you do your power, then you do your multiplication. So in this case, I have a 1, so it's just going to be 9 minus 18 plus 13. And then you're just going to add and subtract from left to right. So 9 take away 18 is negative 9. And negative 9 plus 13 is 4. So the y value of my vertex is 4. So therefore, I now know that my vertex is, in this case, going to be 3 for the x and 4 for the y. The last step is just as easy as it was with the vertex form. All you have to do is look at your a. Okay. If you have a positive a, then it's a happy face. If you have a negative a, then it's a sad face. So at this point, we're actually ready to go ahead and graph. So the issue is, is that when it's in vertex form, you can see your vertex. That's what makes it so easy. But when it's not in vertex form, you have to calculate your vertex using these three steps right here. Oops backed up a little bit. Those three steps. Alright, so my vertex was over 3 and up 4, and we had a happy face parabola. And there we go. That'll be enough to get you the right answer on your quiz, okay? Okay, um, so that's number 18. Let's go ahead and continue on down here to the last two problems, um, 20 and 22. Okay. So what we have here is we have a piecewise function. The function is f of x. But this function is a parabola for all values of x less than 2. It's a linear function for all values of x between 2 and 5. And it's an absolute value function for all values of x greater than 5. Now, I don't know what this graph looks like. I'm not going to ask you to graph it, but I'll just kind of fudge one here. Here's where x equals 2. Here's where x equals 5. And so I know that for all values of x less than 2, it's like a parabola, so maybe it looks like this. And then for all values of x between 2 and 5, it's like a straight line, so maybe it looks like this. And then for all values of x greater than 5, um, who knows, it looks like an absolute value function, so maybe it just looks like a v, right? It's difficult to say, but that's what a piecewise function is. Um, that's not what the graph really looks like. I'm just kind of giving you guys a, a brief understanding of what a piecewise function is. But what we're being asked to do here on numbers 20 and 22 is I'm asking you guys to evaluate the function. Find f of 8. Now, usually that just means you plug the 8 into the equation, right? But the problem is, is which equation do you plug it into? There's three of them. Do you do it to all three? No. You only got to plug it into one of them. And how do you know which one to plug it into? Well, you have to look at your x value. That's an 8. Now, let me ask you, is 8 less than 2? No. Is x between 2 and 5? I'm sorry, is 8 between 2 and 5? No. Is 8 greater than 5? Ding, ding, ding. There it is. So we're going to be plugging it into this piece. So the way that you know which piece to plug it into is by looking at these inequalities and figuring out which inequality goes with that value. So now that we know which one to plug it into, we're just going to go ahead and do that. We're going to have 1 minus x, but x we're plugging in 8 for the x. And the absolute value of, um, well, 1 minus 8 is negative 7, and the absolute value of that would be positive 7. So that would be the answer for number 20. Now, number 22 is an interesting case, so let, let's see if we can figure out which piece to use for that one. I want to plug in 5. Is 5 less than 2? No. Is 5 in this interval? Well, I don't know. It's kind of hard to see. Let, let's write it out and actually see if it makes sense. If I put a 5 here where the x is at, is this a true statement? Well, 5 is greater than or equal to 2, so that's good. Is 5 less than 5? No, it's not. So it doesn't work here. In fact, now we know that, once again, it also applies to the bottom. If I just replace this x with a 5, is 5 greater than or equal to 5? Yeah, it's equal to 5, so there's our winner once again. So for the ones where it's actually a boundary point, in other words, one of the numbers that are actually on the inequality, you have to find the one that actually has the equal sign on it. 
And so in this case, once again, we're going to use the same one in this case um, to see if we can get the answer. And that's it. That's the end of it. So I'll leave you guys there, and I'll leave you guys to do the odd ones, and you can check your answers with the answer key, and hopefully all things go smoothly for you, and we will see you in class for a test.